His response was to hit her over the head with his pool cue because his girlfriend dared to say no to him. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpot, this is Sandy, already asleep. And sweet baby Jesus, do I have a case for you today? <laughs> this is one where um, <laughs> I do wanna clear the air and say I am not related to the people that are involved in this case. Um, and I'm probably gonna have to do two parts. So if you're watching this, welcome to part one. I have so many notes like I knew about this case before but I never I never even realized just how much there was even behind what happened so I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna explain it I'm just gonna get straight into it. So this is the case of the Philpot family fire. So on the 11th of May 2012 at around 4 a.m a house on Victory Robe in Derby went up in flames. The family that lived there were the Philpots and six of their children were inside the house at the time of the fire. You're gonna hate me, but I'm gonna pause there. There's a lot you need to know about the background of this case before things start making sense, but at least now you know this is not just a small little fire. This Basically their entire house went up in flames. There are reasons why it happened, there are weird things about how it happened, and you need to know a bit about the family's background. So let's get into that. So Mick Philpot was born in 1956 and grew up in Derbyshire in England. I unfortunately couldn't find any information on his early life and his early, early background uh, because I feel like that might be interesting. But what we do know is that Mick was described as controlling, aggressive, domineering and manipulative. So let's get into Mick's love life. When he was 19, he got into a relationship with a girl called Kim Hill, who was 15 at the time, which is already a red flag to me because dude, like she's not even legal. Do you know what I mean? And although four years isn't the biggest difference ever, at that age, I mean, you do so much emotional, physical, sexual maturing in between 15 and 19 years old that that's a bit feel like it's a bit problematic. And Mick and Kim definitely didn't have an ideal relationship and that was, I mean, solely because of Mick. Mick was working in the army at the time but he was getting so excessively paranoid that he would actually miss work so that he could hang around Kim and make sure she wasn't going to see anyone and she wasn't cheating on him and, and all this stuff. He just wanted to keep an eye on her constantly. On one occasion, Mick shot Kim in the groin because he felt her dress was too short. Use your words, like. On another occasion, the couple were out in a bar with some friends and Mick asked Kim, would she play a game of pool with him? Kim said no, because she was chatting to one of her friends and Mick just lost the plot. His response was to hit her over the head with his pool cue because his girlfriend dared to say no to him. On another occasion, he cracked her kneecap with a hammer because she was paying too much attention to the baby that she was minding at the time. <sighs> Did anyone else just get chills there because... Ugh. Over the years, he broke several of her bones and when he got really angry, he would bend her fingers back until they broke. Ooh! I'm honestly like trying to mind my hands just even thinking of that. I cannot even imagine what that must have been like for her being in that relationship because obviously she was terrified to be in the relationship she didn't want to be in it but she was terrified to leave it too this is like we've seen this before with abusive relationships like the Estina Bluny case that I covered a few weeks ago <laughs> Mick would also be violent towards Kim in public and in front of people he didn't care who saw in fact I'm pretty sure he liked the fact that other people could see because it kind of added another layer to the abuse it was the humiliation aspect as well instead of just the physical abuse. Not to make it sound like the physical abuse wasn't bad, but you know what I mean. So they were together for two years, but in July of 1978, Kim had decided, no, nah. she had had enough. So she sent Mick a letter, basically telling him that she was leaving him. And Mick did not like this at all. In fact, his response was to break into her house after midnight. When he did this, he sat in their living room for a while stole some money out of Kim's purse, casually, like did not care about anyone else other than himself. 
And then he took a knife from the kitchen. And I think you can guess where this is going. Mick then went upstairs and into Kim's bedroom and stabbed her multiple times. Obviously Kim started screaming and her mother ended up running in and trying to get Mick away from her. But then Mick obviously didn't like that either. So he turned his attention to her mother and he started trying to stab her. Now the mother ran downstairs and tried to get away, but Mick unfortunately caught up with her and stabbed her 11 times. After that, he went back upstairs and continued the attack on Kim. Now, by some miracle, Kim actually survived this attack, but she was not in a great way. She had a punctured bladder, liver, kidney, bell, and both of her lungs had collapsed. But on that night when they called the emergency services, Mick was still in the house when they arrived and he was just sitting on the stairs and still holding the bloody knife. This next part freaks me out, but he told the paramedics not to bother and that he had done a good job on her. Ah, pins and needles, pins and needles. So after this event, Kim had to spend four months in hospital. I mean, she's lucky she survived, but what an unnecessary trauma. And luckily, of course, Mick was convicted of attempted murder of Kim and grievous bodily harm of Kim's mother. And he was sentenced to 12 years in prison in 1978, which honestly, I already feel like isn't enough. But this next part, is <sighs> it's gonna anger some of you. So, oh, <laughs> believe it or not, Mick actually got out after only three years and two months in prison after attempted murder and grievous bodily harm to two different people. So of course, in 1981, he was set free and he was out living his best life, basically. In 1986 then, he got married to a woman called Pamela Lomax and Mick and Pamela had three children together, two boys and one girl. But again, Mick was so controlling and it wasn't long until Pamela feared for her own safety as well. But of course, she was afraid to break it off she didn't want to be with him because he was awful, but I'm sure she knew about his history and what he had done before. She essentially just wished and prayed that he would just move on and find someone else because she was too afraid to actually break up with him. And then luckily for Pamela, he actually did find someone else, but it's not all good news, I guess. So it was now at the age of 37 that Mick found a new girl and her name was Heather Kehoe and she was 14 years old. He was 30 fucking seven. I thought 15 and 19 was bad. Blech. On Heather's 16th birthday, she actually ran away from home to go live with Mick. And pretty soon after that, she got pregnant and ended up giving birth to a baby boy. Not long after that, she got pregnant again and then gave birth to another baby boy. So in case you haven't been counting, Mick now has five children three with Pamela, two with Heather. So Heather was hardly even an adult when she had two babies to deal with, along with a pretty abusive relationship. Like I said, Heather had two baby boys with Mick and Mick wasn't happy about this because he wanted a daughter from her. And because she hadn't given him a daughter, he started to beat her. He even taught his older sons who he'd had with Pamela to beat her as well. And they would be around nine or 10-ish at this point. What was usual following arguments was he'd lock her outside in the back garden and Heather's described how on previous times she'd actually just curl up around the outside toilet until he was ready to let her back in. Uh, but on this occasion, I think she'd realised that enough was enough. She actually fled from the address, she climbed over the fence to get away from him and later went to the police station to report what happened. As awful as it is for Heather, because it is awful for Heather, it's also awful for the kids because they're being taught that the right thing to do is beat people and just be violent with women and oh, makes me so mad. Interestingly enough, in 1991, there was another issue. <laughs> Mick was given conditional discharge for an assault that he carried out on a colleague where he head butted them. So now we can fast forward a little bit further down the line to the year 2000, when Mick Philpott met a woman called Mairead Duffy. Mairead was a 19 year old single mother who was born to an Irish family in England and she had actually just left an abusive relationship and now she was getting into a relationship with Mick. Ugh. 
Shortly after that, she did move in with Mick. And then, uh, while that was on the go, Mick met another girl in 2001 called Lisa Willis. Lisa was a 16 year old orphan and single mother. So she already had a difficult enough life and she became his mistress. By the way, for legal reasons, her identity is protected. So I've no pictures of her or anything that, and that's why. But also the age gap. He was 45 at this point and she was 16. And I mean, it's already bad enough that he was 45 and he was with Mairead who was 19 or maybe 20 at this point. But like, whoa. So in 2003, Mick and Mairead got married and Lisa actually served as a bridesmaid at that wedding, which is so wild. And Mick invited Lisa to live with them in their council house. Now, the living arrangements were a little weird. <laughs> so they had this semi-detached council house and Mick had a caravan down the side. So he would actually sleep in the caravan and Mairead and Lisa would alternate nights with him. Now normally, if this caravan's rocking, you may not come knocking because this is where it all happens. As you can see, this is a nice, um, nice big king-sized bed. This is where the, uh, the action takes place, if you know what I mean. I'm not gonna say too much about it, but yeah. One night I'll have Mairead in here, and then the next night I'll have Lisa in. And both of the women seemed to be happy enough, like they, they said they were happy with it and everything. You're happy with the way <laughs> the, the way things have worked out? Yeah. And the relationship that the uh, threesome works <laughs> works okay? It's not the th like a threesome, but yeah. It's, but you have to share it. I'm happy mm. the way it is, yeah. And you're happy to share it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. But it's also theorised that they just were too scared to go against him. Over this period of time, Mairead had a cleaning job and she'd often turn up to work with bruises on her face. And obviously her colleagues and her friends were like, and Mick would also chat up other women, even in front of Lisa and Mairead sometimes, like they'd go to a bar and he'd just chat to the girl beside him and like Lisa or Mairead would just be standing there like his date who's not getting any attention and watching him flirt with other women. So you're born with a dick between your legs, not just to pee out of, so I'm gonna use it. So say like, for instance, I went out, and there was some nice young lady, and she gave me the eye and the come on, and I knew she wanted it. I'd oblige, because I'm a red hot blooded male at the end of the day. And I'm not gonna, I don't even know me whilst listening, I ain't gonna turn it down. Oh, I don't know, it's just really weird. Did you notice that I can't even tell this story without being like, <laughs> my face because it's just his misogyny is just on the next level and he just has no regard for human life if they're female he just does not care about women fast forward to 2010 mick was given a police warning for slapping Mairead and dragging her outside by her hair let's just take a little mental break here how charming was this guy like he got so many women over the years not just to you know, have sex with him or be in a relationship with him, but to have his children and everything. He was a total creep. He couldn't offer anything materialistic to any women because he was living in a council house. And and actually something I didn't even mention was <laughs> like Mairead and Lisa would literally have to beg him if they wanted money to buy anything. Like he was in control of the family's finances and they didn't have any say. And also like, I don't like calling people ugly, but... And he was controlling and abusive. I understand the whole staying with someone if they're controlling and abusive because you're afraid of them, but I don't even know how he got into the position where he could control and abuse them. Like, if a guy like that even looked at me, I'd be like, I suppose his main thing was that he really did prey on vulnerable women. like. Obviously women that were way younger than him, so he had a bit more control over them. Lisa, for example, was 16 years old, an orphan and a single mother. And in no way am I blaming her at all. <laughs> but like, you know, he saw that and he took that as an opportunity to totally manipulate this person. Talk about a disgusting freak. All right, into Mick's lifestyle. In 2006, Mick actually got a lot of media attention because he wanted a bigger council house. And to be fair, he did have a lot of kids and it was only a three bedroom house. But just to catch you up on how many people were in the house at this point. So you've got Mick himself, 
Maraid, his wife, Lisa, his mistress, four children he had with Maraid, three children he had with Lisa, and Lisa's child who she had before she met him. Actually, I'm just looking over this footage again and I've just realized that before Mick and Maraid were together, she had already been a single mother. So she had one child before getting with Mick. So it's one plus what I'm about to say. So 12. <laughs> That's 11 people in one three bedroom, semi-detached house. So I, I get it, but this is people's tax money, dude. And because the tabloids were now aware of him, it wasn't long until people started realizing that this was the same guy that was arrested and went to prison for attempted murder and grievous bodily harm in 1978, so. But anyway, following this, more kids. Fuck them. I'm gonna have some more babies. Lisa gave birth to a fourth child and then she announced that both she and Maraid were pregnant at the same time. So they were gonna have one more child each. A again. It became pretty clear that Mick Philpot was having all these kids so that he could make the most of the child benefits payments that, uh, that the government gave him. And trust me, I have no judgment against anyone who gets child benefit payments. It's just the fact that his main reason for having all these kids were because they were literally his source of income. Mick Philpott wasn't just getting benefits for his kids, he was having kids to get the benefits. And therein lies my issue. <laughs> that said, I was really curious about like, well, he was abusive towards these women. Was he horrible to his kids as well? But as far as I'm aware, he actually wasn't that bad with them. Like he, he did love them. He treated them well. I'm sure he wasn't like number one dad, but he didn't seem to be that bad. As far as I'm aware. Unsurprisingly though, he did, uh, he did make an appearance on Jeremy Kyle and also on This Morning, which is a morning chat show in the UK. He also starred in an ITV documentary called Anne Whittacombe versus... versus something. And in this documentary, a woman called Anne Whittacombe maybe even went to live with him or worked with him for a week or something like that to try and convince him into a better life. And over the course of this week, she actually found him three jobs. And for two of them, I'm not actually sure how that went, but I do know that for one of them, he didn't even bother showing up on the first day, so. I, I, I am Get working. a job. I'm looking after my Get kids. Get a job. Listen, this shows you what a bitch Get you are, don't it? Get a job. You, useless, you are. Yeah, Seriously, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. like the rest. Talk yeah. to that, because you're not worth your I attention. Work, mate. There were certainly moments when I stepped back, if you like, moments when I flinched away from him. You're a coward. As soon as a coward, bitch. Let's fucking move it. There was a pent up anger there. I mean, he didn't want to work and he also had all these children that were paying the bills. So he just didn't see the value in working. He was like, well, I've got like 15 kids at this point. You know, I'm good <laughs> or whatever amount of kids he had at this point. I think we're all losing count. <laughs> I've got two lovely women and I've got 18 lovely kids and I've got 11 of my own. There's not many people outside who can turn around and say he's got plenty of money so they've got what I've got, I'm happy. Allegedly, he also referred to women as bitch. He's like, oh, these bitches over here and those bitches over there. Like he saw them as subhuman, like they were less of a human for being a woman. So there you go. There's some interesting facts about how he lived his life. Now, in addition to all of the sex they must have been having to have all those kids, Mick and Maraid started dogging. When I first read about this, I thought it meant doggy style, but obviously not. <laughs> Naive little Kate. Here is the definition of what that means. Dogging is a British English slang term for engaging in sexual acts in a public or semi-public place or watching others do so. There may be more than two participants. Voyeurism and exhibitionism are closely associated with dogging. So that's that. And from these sexual acts, Maraid actually got pregnant again but from another man. But she did abort this pregnancy because Mick told her to. In November of 2011, there was a road rage incident where Mick, he literally got out of the car and punched another driver. So Mick pleaded guilty to common assault, but he denied any dangerous driving. So now we get to a point where things start seriously going downhill. In February, 2012, Lisa decided to separate from Mick and 
well, it's not just Mick that he's separating from, I suppose, it's like separating from the whole family. Remember that Lisa was the mistress and she went on to live with her sister and her brother-in-law along with the four children that she had had with Mick and her son from the previous relationship. So obviously this really angered Mick because his main thing was he wanted to be in control. Control of the family's finances, control of the women in his life, just everything. So to him, it was like the fact that Lisa had the audacity to leave. Like he didn't even think she deserved to have the power to do such a thing. So he was obviously not happy about it. Their split did result in a custody battle for the children between Mick and Lisa because <laughs> they were Mick's little money makers, weren't they? Mick wanted to be able to claim benefits for him and if he didn't have custody, he wouldn't be able to do that, so... <laughs> All right, so the next big thing to happen in this case was the fire, so let's go. Like I said, on the 11th of May, 2012, their house went up in flames. <clears throat> no, 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 Sunny, no. My dad's just gone for lunch, so she does not want to be here now. So the two brothers that lived next door, Darren and Jamie Butler, woke up to the smell of smoke at around 4 a.m. They were at the scene before the emergency services even got there. They said when they saw the fire initially, it was about a foot high at the door of the Philpot house. And by the time they got to the house, which they were literally next door, did not take long, it was 10 times higher. And Darren and Jamie knew that there were kids inside. So they were determined to try and save these children. So obviously they couldn't get in the front door because the fire was like totally blocking it. So Darren got up on top of the caravan that was at the side of the house because behind this caravan, there was another entrance. And he did manage to get inside the house, but that was where the successes ended. Okay, anyone who's watching this on Friday or Saturday morning, I know you're gonna hate me. I'm gonna leave that there. Part two will be up tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. Irish time, which is GMT plus one, I think. So I'll just do a little mini intro. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, get on that video tomorrow because <laughs> we are just getting started, baby. Whew. Also, I've been really feeling out TikTok lately. Um, I have been uploading on there like two or three times a day and I'm, I started it ironically and uh, now I'm a regular so <laughs> go follow me on there I'm starting to do like more true crime related content as well so like yeah I'm, I'm feeling it we'll we'll see we'll see how, how we get on I will see you tomorrow <laughs> bye